thank you very much for coming. Sunday afternoon, I know it's a lot to ask, <laughs> to kind of be working. Um, uh, a little bit about me, I'm an accessibility specialist. I run a company called Accessibility Oz, and we do a lot of work in the US with higher education. And we also build WordPress sites mainly for disability service providers. And I actually <laughs> not, never have the twain to meet. Um, I never actually thought that WordPress could be used in an enterprise system um, like higher education. Um, higher education, of course, is very unique, as I'm sure you all know, uh, where you've got hundreds, maybe thousands of websites. No one knows who owns them. You know, they're sometimes tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages large. Uh, multiple CMSs, multiple content authors, and always teeny tiny budgets. So, you know, higher education and is always an interesting topic. It's always difficult, and I'm really glad to learn that WordPress is something that can be used in higher education. Um, so I'm moderating the panel today, and uh, we have three speakers. To my left is Guillaume. <laughs> I've been trying to pronounce that name correctly all, all week. Um, and Guillaume is a uh, uh, senior web and application developer at Harvard um, at the TH Chan School of Public Health, where he manages over 1,900 websites uh, with a WordPress multi-site installation hosted on Amazon Web Services. And next to Guillaume is Mike. Is Mike just checking? And he is the manager of digital communications at the University of Maine, and he spoke earlier today. Um, responsible for the web presence and marketing strategy at the flagship campus of their public university system. He's managed enterprise websites for over 20 years, joined UMaine in 2014, and is passionate about the potential a robust internet presence can bring. And on, on the end is Jonathan Perlman, who's an experienced web developer and teacher who works at Dawson College and also spoke this morning um, in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, builds custom web solutions for students, faculty and staff. Uh, so I um, wanted to start with a question about really how WordPress differs uh, when you're talking about an enterprise solution for higher education than, you know, like a static kind of brochure website. Start with you, Guillaume. You can even have your microphone back. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think WordPress differs in probably the size of its community. Uh, lots of resource available. A lot of higher ed institutions have pretty small development teams. We don't have a lot of time to devote and a lot of budget to devote to development. So having a lot of resources available, open source really uh, is a great asset for uh, our uh, kind of job. Uh, and the second thing I think is Again, and that goes back to the previous talk from Brian uh, about content management. A lot of our websites are managed by our users, and WordPress is very user friendly. Not to say the most user friendly, but very user friendly, and a lot of people actually enjoy using it to to manage the content. So I think, in that matter, to WordPress is great for higher head uh, website. So I'd like to add that the um, I've had experience in other jobs with other enterprise content management systems. So comparing WordPress to other enterprise systems, uh, one of the biggest differences I find is you have less of a barrier for new content, not new content contributors to come in, uh, mainly because they've already had experience with WordPress in other realms, such as a WordPress.com site or a personal site that they may have set up or another site that another uh, organization has worked with, uh, even if it's a standalone, one-off WordPress site. Um, in other jobs that I've had where we had another content management system, uh, there was a big learning curve uh, because they're all different and they all have their own unique quirks uh, and typically they're of a price point that uh, prior to joining your enterprise, they haven't been exposed to that one yet, so it's a, it, they start at a much lower skill level. Thank you. Jonathan? So WordPress is good in higher ed because of the fact that it's very extensible, it's very uh, customizable. Uh, it can tie to a lot of different enterprise level systems, assuming those systems have those content endpoints, endpoints. Uh, I've tied this to uh, our simple information system, I've tied it to uh, SharePoint, I've tied it to various systems within the enterprise space. And on top of that, um, 
Yeah, it's built for scalability. It's built for uh, security, ultimately. Uh, well, plugins, the plugin ecosystem is not not all plugins work for everybody, and a lot of plugins certainly don't work in higher education. But um, but the core WordPress itself is actually uh, pretty stable and robust to handle the, the needs of higher ed. That's great. And now I'd like to open up questions from the audience. And to get the questions going, if you ask a question, you get a koala. <laughs> Come on, people, who wants a koala? Sunday afternoon. Come on. Who's got kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can come up to the microphone, that'd be great. So in a collegiate uh, setting, how do you deal with uh, setting policy and governance in place with website decisions, such as accessibility standards or grant standards in general? Who wants to take that? So I guess um, for University of Maine, uh, we actually went through a huge branding initiative that WordPress had a role in because a lot of folks had their own standalone websites and were forced you know, under you know, duress from the president's office to get into the WordPress system, uh, including uh, University of Maine Museum of Art, which um, w came begrudgingly and complainingly about it. Uh, so as far as governance goes, it's helpful to have uh, top-down approval for the concept of branding. Uh, we've since changed presidential administrations uh, and the new, the, well not new, she's there, been there for a few years. For all the great things that she's done, she has a much lower uh, focus on the branding. So it was helpful that we had already gone through that because now that they've adopted the branding, they have, uh, agree with it. Um, but managing the WordPress system, it's good to lock it down to you not letting people you know, install their own plugins and uh, give a, make sure that the uh, faculty understands that when a graduate student comes in with great ideas for what they can do with their WordPress website, that uh, the plugin requests will have to be vetted. And typically, we won't just install a plugin that is a third-party plugin, but we'll look at how to adopt that kind of functionality into the theme so that everyone can use it. Uh, mainly because when that graduate student leaves, then the understanding of that plugin leaves with them. Uh, so you end up with plugins that you don't know why they're being in there, why they're active on a site. Uh, so it's good to keep track of that stuff. Um, regarding branding, we have two, I would say two, two initiatives. Uh, the first one, well actually it's, it's one into one. And so we have the school's website, which, it, which has like a very strict theme, school brand, et cetera. Then we have a second separate hosting environment for people who want a more customized website. So that that splits kind of like the super branded content from the more flexible one. And on that flexible hosting environment, we have a pretty big uh, initiative right now where we're building that, uh, that theme called the affiliate template, which is fully branded, but at the same time gives a lot of flexibility and a lot of customization options to people. So we found that that offering was actually satisfying a lot of people because they can do their little, you know, tweaking and changing things and have a, a website that is like their own, but at the same time keeps, you know, we use the font, the correct font, the logo is placed correctly, has the good like proportions and things like that, and that has helped us a lot. And this is a very much ongoing uh, initiative, but it, is been, it has been a really good help to keep things uh, in track. And the last thing is, fortunately, we're big enough that we have a marketing department and they have been very involved into, uh, you know, keeping track of what people are doing and reaching out to them saying, you know, this is not okay because this is out of the brand, but here is how you could do it or we're going to help you finding, you know, a uh, good stock image that sticks to the brand, etc., etc. But yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that, do you get a request, because we've had this as well, where um, uh, website owners want to put uh, logos from uh, you know, sponsorship logos or partner logos. Do you have clear policies on when logos are allowed that are outside of your university's logo? Um, yep. Uh, we, we do have policies, and uh, so that affiliate template has actually an option for removing the, the school's branding. Uh, we have a lot of... Uh, initiatives, 
uh, NGOs, etc., that are affiliated to the school, but that are not necessarily from the brand of the school. They're not only the school or their initiative between you know BU and Harvard, and they don't want only Harvard to appear as the main brand, and they just want like the the initiative brand as so. This, this is an option that the affiliate template is giving: is to remove the Harvard branding. Uh, but yeah, great. In terms of revenue, Dawson, what we do is uh, similar to uh, what Gail was saying: is that our marketing team, our communications team, is involved, and we have uh, internal development that has uh, created uh, reports for the internal uh, communications team. But they essentially review the pages, review the changes uh, on a semi-annual, semi-daily basis, uh, by a weekly basis, and they're just reviewing the content changes, reaching out to the content editors to ensure that they're understanding of what is. Dawson branding and what is Dawson tone and so on. Um, at, at Washington State University, what they do is uh, they actually pre train their users, and the users have to go through uh, a good two hour training and they have to sign off on testing that they do understand all the guidelines and the branding and that they can attest to the fact that they can have passed a course on uh, editing a website with all of the accessibility and the branding and the guidelines that, that they come forth. For Washington State University, and on the uh, WP Campus podcast that was spoken about with Sean Keith and Brian DeConnick, you can check that out at wpcampus.org. Excellent, thank you very much. Question? Yeah, so I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and we've done a couple of different smaller university websites right now, 700, 800 pages each. Uh, but we've just landed a contract with the University of Texas at San Antonio. And they basically want little miniature WordPress sites for all their individual departments. So we're looking at something like 40 or 50 departments at this point. Is it, in your experience, a better scenario to use multi-site in that uh, capacity? Or do you, because here's the problem we're running into. It's obviously the different politics in each department. We're running into the ownership issue in each department. We're running into the fact that they want to be on their own servers, even have their, you know, uh, IT departments manage things, so help me, help them have a better organizational uh, strategy in place where if you do recommend multi-site, please tell me how to sell it to them. Who wants to start that conversation? Go, Jonathan. So multi-site, let's, have, let's define multi-site first. Multi-site is one code base for your website, where you have, you have one website or 10,000 sites. It's one code base. Therefore, you have one set of plugins, you have one set of themes, you have one set of everything. Therefore, you're managing the code, and I stress the code. Um, you're managing one place, that's what you're doing. So therefore, at that point, you can have one or 1,000. Um, whether it's a subdirectory installed, therefore, domain.com slash uh, division, or division dot, dot domain.com. So, um, you know, the higher ed, but some of the bigger universities, what they're also doing is doing networks of multi sites. So, you might want to reach out to maybe a Jeremy Felt. He's on the uh, multi site team for WordPress Core. He's actually running a network of multi sites, which then might help you with the different colleges to keep the multi sites in, tra in, in track. He basically has everything in one massive, humongous multi site. Uh, yes, multi-site is the way to go at that point. Um, it will be on one server, but ultimately you can definitely scale that as multiple servers. But it's again, it's one code base, remember that. Um, but again, permission-wise, you can definitely segregate everybody. And that's the reason why we went through the same question of multi-site or not to multi-site. That is the question. And um, no, we went multi-site because of the segregation factor and the fact that everybody has their own uh, you know, the media library, they have their own list of posts, they have all their own pages, and then of course they can manage everything on their own. Now, um, in relation to in, keeping it separate in single sites, the only reason you want to single site it is because if they're doing something different, if let's say for example you want to sell courses online and actually have like, like WooCommerce, and uh, so you don't want to have WooCommerce in with your main multi site at that point. It's a big and powerful plugin that can do a lot and it can interact with a lot of different things that you don't want to have interaction with your other uh, plugins you have in your multi site. So it's not really the politics of the university or the college that is the issue, it's the code base. So therefore, think about your plugins, think about the, the needs of the plugins, 
And if the plugin doesn't match the rest of the, the, rest of the installation, break it out. I'll add to that as a selling point for uh, getting people interested in uh, a bit, you know, agreeing that multi-site is the way to go. Um, WordPress out of the box doesn't have a good grouping mechanism. Uh, you've got a great user role, but you can't just assign users to groups and then assign permissions to those groups or assign sets of pages to those groups. So multi-site fills that niche out of core. Uh, there are layers, there are plugins you can add in there, but out of the box, you can just go with multi-site, which is what we've done, where each department gets their own site, and that's how you can segregate this group from that group. And then as, but it's one big pool of users. So a user might be an admin on one site, an editor on another site, and just a reader or an author on another site, but they have a nice little um, drop down in their admin toolbar where they can see all the sites that they have access to and quickly toggle between them. Uh, and then the other aspect of that is uh, just giving them the ability to have, you know, we have this plugin for this or this theme for this site and this other theme for this site. So it gives you much more flexibility for uh, when you have to make a change that you don't have to make that change for every page on a multi-thousand, 20,000 page website. You can subdivide it amongst dozens of little sites. Um, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with, with what, what has been said so far. Uh, I would add the cost factor. Uh, hosting one WordPress multi-site is definitely going to be less expensive than hosting 10 or 12 single installations where you need 10 or 12 servers, 10 or 12 license for your web application firewall, for all those services that you need, you're gonna need you know, to multiply this by, by a factor of you know, the number of websites you have, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, I would say the only potential, if, if you really end up needing to stick to uh, multiple single installation versus the multi-site, uh, I would definitely recommend looking into, there's a lot of new services and plugins that allows you to do like uh, mo manage multiple website, uh, multiple installations of WordPress remotely from like one single location, one dashboard, and that might be a good solution if you end up, you know, and that allows you to update your plugins, update your themes, update WordPress, etc. Every all your installations in one place. So that might be an alternative for you, uh, but I, I would definitely favor multi-site for all the reasons that have been mentioned before. Thank you. Next uh, question. So coming at that question in a slightly different way, instead of how, whether you use multi-site or not, how have you thought about preventing site scroll? Universities seem to have a really great ability to spin out a new <laughs> website every time anyone on paper on campus has an idea and never decommission any of them. So if you have any advice on how to actually eliminate sites and consolidate them to pages higher up in the hierarchy, where it makes sense, where it sort of redirects so much energy with we yeah, started to do that, therefore we need a new website. Three years later, it hasn't been touched. It could have been just a page on the department site. Um, I think I can take that uh, short answer whereby basically, um, for what we do, as an example, we have one team, we may want to rule them all, therefore, at that point, everybody has that one look and feel for that site. So, therefore, uh, we do, in fact, to speak to your example, we do actually have one site where basically all they have is like two pages. All they have. So, do we put, a, do we put them on their own little site or do we make them? Uh, as part of the main site. Well, at that point, again, it's down to content ownership and you know, longevity. Do they really want to expand on it or not? Um, and on top of that, really, a site essentially could be just a folder, a virtual folder on the, uh, within the website. So therefore, yes, I do agree that within five, ten years, there is, there is going to be sprawl, but at that point, uh, then the sites can be reevaluated and uh, things can be moved around. I'll add to that that when you're managing your, in your multi-site network, you'll have the network admin dashboard and a quick and dirty way to just get an idea of whether these are in use or not is you can sort that list of sites by the last time they were touched, uh, by the you know, last time they were uh, modified. Now this might just mean that somebody had logged in and uploaded a PDF to that site, but it, it will expose those sites that are completely abandoned. Uh, and we've gone through this with, uh, as we're migrating these sites, we are uh, still in a migration process. Uh, we've gotten 300 or so sites into the new system, but we still have 100 sites in the old server 
And some of these I'm tracking down that haven't been touched in years. Uh, and then it's a matter of finding who the owner is. And in some cases, I find the owner and they say, oh yeah, we want that site, but we're not touching it anymore. So it's a matter of convincing them to migrate it into the new system. Uh, and asking, can you just get these as pages into your parent site that you, we know you're managing? The only problem with that, and I spent um, five years at Monash University, which is one of the biggest universities in Australia, um, managing their usability and accessibility services. I came on board just after they implemented a new CMS, and with the new CMS, which was, wasn't WordPress, but with the new CMS, they had a rule that if a page wasn't touched or changed in one year, then it would automatically be deleted. Mm. And we woke up one day and the whole faculty of law had disappeared. <laughs> so you do need to be careful of things like that. Um, so yeah, automatically deleting, deleting things is not a good idea. But do you want to add anything here? Um, I'm a big book, so I will disagree and, and agree with Jen. De deleting is probably not a, the, the good solution. Uh, you still have some ways with WordPress to archive versus deleting, etc., uh, or unpublishing at least. I'm a big believer into uh, uh, expiration dates for content. Uh, okay, you have a conference, you put a, you put up a website for a conference. You may want it to be online for another year, but in two or three years or whatever, you know. And the same thing if you're creating a page for documentation for your email software, there's a pretty good chance that in two or three years this documentation is not going to be good anymore because, you know, updates and new email software, etc. So I'm a big believer into uh, expiration dates, but obviously you need to think about it. You need to put warning into place saying, hey, this page is about to get archived automatically, etc. Uh, but I think that's a, a good approach. Yeah, I'll add to that. We had a, a, a gotcha moment with our calendar. Uh, we put in some expiration dates because our calendar system had thousands of records in it that were all published, but these were published from 2015. And nobody wants to go backward in time on a calendar to see what was happening years ago. So we put a rule that after uh, 12 months after the event, that item goes into the trash. Well. Turns out that our uh, admin for those managing the calendar would get the academic calendar mapped out years in advance. So they would sit down in one sitting and put out, we've already got the academic calendar mapped out to 2020. Well, those records get a year old and all of a sudden the academic calendar has disappeared. Not because that content was stale, but because that content was added so early on. So you got to really think through some of these gotcha modes and any kind of automation um, it's good to put your own reminders in to keep track of to make sure that it's not doing something you didn't want to. Um, I'll actually last note on that is that basically there is, uh, by default, there's a little content tracking with the WordPress and timelines. So there's a plugin on the, the uh, WordPress plugin uh, directory content audit by Stephanie Leary. And uh, she basically has written a plugin in for higher education and her needs that will allow you to set the expiration dates uh, post by post, page by page, and then specific administrators and or uh, site content owners will get emails uh, a year later, two years later, whatever the date is. And uh, <clears throat> sort of while I remember this, uh, also WordPress doesn't store the last time a user has logged in. Yeah. So what will happen is that if you do want to have that kind of information, you're going to want to install, um, I don't know what plugin this is, but it's it's a meta field that you can create uh, basically that store that content and then uh, within the user meta fields and then uh, basically that will allow you to track when the user logs in. So which means at the time of putting in this plugin, uh, you won't know how old these users really are until you start tracking. Can you just give me the name of that plugin so I can tweet it out? Um, actually, I already did tweet it out. It's okay. on my Twitter. It's on the hashtag with uh, WCBOS, but it is Content Audit by Stephanie Leary. Okay. S. Leary, I believe. Great. Thank you. Next question. Okay, so, working with a new school process, I noticed a lot of times that there's a lot of content managers, and some of those content managers leave the school and are no longer working there. And a year later, we find out that this person has an administrative access and no longer works there. And you guys use single sign-on, or is there a person that is assigned to just manage your users? Uh, so the question, just because it was a little um, soft, was, uh, you know, you have content managers, managers, and they disappear, or they leave. 
and all of a sudden, you know, who owns the content? So, you know, how have you, in, you know, used that? Do you use single sign-on and how do you deal with that particular issue? Who wants to start? Well, I do not use single sign-on. That's something we want to pursue for that very reason. Um, yeah. So we, we do use a, a single sign-on system and we also have two-factor authentication that is like a compulsory for everyone now, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, so we do not currently clean up our users. Uh, we've implemented the single sign-on last year. That was like the first step. We have uh, a project to implement like cl cleaning up users, but there's a couple problems again because one, once you delete the user, you need to reattribute the content, who's the correct person to do this, to do that, etc. So there's a couple problems with that. But the fact that we implemented single sign-on already ensure that that user will not be able to log in anymore because their identity is disabled at the university level and they can't log into the website anymore, even if technically their username still exists. Uh, similar to my situation whereby basically um, our users cannot log into our WordPress infrastructure from the outside of campus. So right now I can't log into my own websites without logging into my VPN. So therefore, from outside the campus, they're locked down. Uh, we also hook up our WordPress infrastructure to Active Directory with the next Active Directory integration plugin. And then, so basically, once we lock out a user in Active Directory, they're locked out across the board, even if they're on campus. Uh, as per the attrition, attrition to content, we're not that really old in the WordPress game, so therefore we're not, we've only been there three or four years. So at that point, uh, we, will, we are running into the issue of the fact that when a user does leave, who do we reassign the content to? So at that point, uh, we'll have, we are going to have to deal with this down the road. Okay, so um, what are your favorite plugins for higher education? Jonathan, you've mentioned a couple. Do you want to get started? I've uh, mentioned a couple, definitely. Um, to manage data within WordPress, um, admin columns by CodePress, it's a free plugin on the, on the directory uh, that allows you to add fields into your admin tables, the uh, metadata fields, uh, extra fields that are just hidden to the WordPress tables. So you can actually add those fields in. Um, of the uh, Active Directory, then the integration is definitely a, a, a time saver on the password level. Um, uh, yeah, WPCLI, where it's not a WordPress tool, but I definitely, I definitely use WPCLI on mass to manage my WordPress infrastructure. Uh, when people, especially when uh, they say, oh, my plugin doesn't work, I've installed too many plugins in my student sites. So when students do create their own WordPress sites, uh, I, I basically just manage all their stuff with WPCLI and I don't even need a login on that. And I just fix everything up to it. Uh, from our end, we uh, have network activated Jetpack, uh, which we were working on performance issues at times with that, but. Uh, all in all, the benefits outweigh performance issues with it. Um, notably, uh, the widget visibility option in Jetpack is really key if you're running WordPress as your core CMS because then you can have more granular control over the widget area of your temp of your theme as to what is displaying on what page and do some pretty sophisticated stuff with showing, uh, you know, on a, especially on posts. Uh, if this, this category, you want to show these widgets, this other category, you show other widgets. Um, and then uh, Yoast uh, SEO, we've installed that uh, to help manage uh, submission of sitemaps to Google and Bing uh, and some other uh, aspects like that. So um, we, we use a lot, we develop a lot of plugins in-house, so we don't necessarily use a ton of community plugins, mostly for performance and security reasons. But uh, two out there that I really, really like, uh, Simple history. Uh, simple history keeps a log of user action on your website. Uh, we used to receive a lot of calls from people, hey, my web page have disappeared, someone deleted it. And you can look into simple history and it will tell you, yes, this user deleted that or moved that menu or changed that widget on, at that day, etc. And it will give you a log of the user's action. So it helped us a lot of to understand what was going on, what was happening. And, and detecting potential real problem versus user mistakes. Uh, and the, the other one that I really like and we use a lot is called Shortcake. Uh, it's 
put a user interface on short codes. Short codes by default are really not user friendly. Trying to explain to a non technical person how to use a short code is very confusing, and I get that. And shortcake uh, kind of get rid of a lot of those problems. It's not perfect, mostly because of the technical limitations that goes with short codes, but that gives the ability to not necessarily use a page builder, but still create some nice, good looking content block. And again, when we talk about branding and those problems, uh, giving people the ability to create some nice content blocks that are in brand, that are you know, good looking, without them trying to play with the options in the editor is usually a good option. So yeah, definitely shortcake. Yeah, shortcake's one that we use as well. I didn't think of it because it's not something that the users are aware of mm -hmm. is a plugin because there's no extra content that appears in their dashboard. It just makes the editor a better experience for them. Um, is it, does anyone from the audience have any plugins they'd like to share specifically for higher ed? On a few occasions, uh, we've had a, a couple of projects have come up and we couldn't necessarily put them into the theme or build a plugin for them because, it, because of the time restraints of overview and, and uh, scheduling. So in a few cases we've actually built a few databases and views out of the tool set, uh, which is run by WT Toolset and it's it's not very expensive but it gives you a it gives you quite a bit of a um, extensive suite to be able to build custom post types within WordPress. some online course content, uh, which is kind of, you know, what universities and higher education does. So have any of you had experience uh, using WordPress instead of an LMS or as an LMS? I'm just going to say that I use, my institution uses Moodle as our LMS, and therefore I'm going to buy on this one. So the University of Maine, we uh, primarily use, uh, identify Blackboard. Uh, as the LMS, um, but we do have some folks that uh, absolutely positively uh, must put their content outside of Blackboard because uh, they need the content available to folks that aren't enrolled at the university. Uh, so we do have a few sites set up uh, for, you know, I think one of them is uh, Computing Courses Online, which is not uh, in our current theme just yet, uh, but it will be migrating soon. There's no reason for it not to. Um, you, typically, it's very basic. We provide a lot of documents uh, for folks. So our new theme, we did set up a custom post type for document management uh, to overcome kind of the limitations of the media library where a PDF, you know, uh, the path to your document will change every time you upload a new, new document. Um, uh, we do also have uh, a scientific diving website that they needed to make the content available to folks that were outside of the university to get their diving accreditation or something like that. So uh, very basic use of WordPress. I wouldn't say that we use anything fancy with uh, quizzes or, or tracking progress in the course, um, but WordPress is totally uh, for providing that content out in a public manner. Um, we use uh, Canvas as our uh, LMS, mm -hmm. uh, Harvard as like a university-wide license for Canvas. It's integrated with our uh, student information system, et cetera. Uh, and at the same time, Harvard is very in, uh, implicated into the development of edX, which is like another LMS solution. Uh, they do it in uh, partnership with MIT and other institutions that I don't remember. Um, however, we sometimes uh, do create small WordPress websites for like smaller 
courses or programs that are not necessarily completely affiliated with the school, etc. We did a project recently and we didn't necessarily use any specific LMS plugins mm -hmm. uh, to do that. We just, as Mike was telling, created a custom post type, a specific user role, a little tweaks here and there, and that worked out great for, 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 our, for this specific case. Uh, however, uh, WordPress is definitely, you can definitely use it as a full-fledged LMS. There's some really, really good uh, LMS plugins out there and there's some really good solutions and I, uh, yeah, there's just plenty of institutions that also use uh, WordPress as a full like LMS solution. Um, and actually there was a really good talk by Chris Lemma uh, at yeah. WP Campus this year. Uh, who is, he's reviewing all the different uh, WordPress plugins as LMS solutions and giving you, you know, what they can do, can't do, etc. Uh, so I would, if you're interested in that, I would definitely suggest uh, checking out his talk as soon as it's published online. Thank you. If you're using uh, WordPress as an LMS system, how how do you manage the purple with that? Um, how do you keep that secure and uh, can it be public facing? So uh, from our standpoint, uh, the reasons that we use uh, the WordPress as the LMS uh, kind of circumvent FERPA, if you will, because it, it's the folks that aren't enrolled that have access to the content. Um, so there's no student data actually uh, entered into the system and no student data is provided through the system. It is just a mechanism for providing the content out. I haven't really thought too much about it, uh, so my answer is going to be very vague. But I would I would argue that you know WordPress doesn't need to be public facing, doesn't need to be like fully open. You can close everything and have it like under complete lock. So you could, you know, in theory, just have something that is like completely locked, and you just need your user login. And and I'm pretty sure again that some of those plugins, the more advanced one that do LMS solutions, offer you the options to you know, decide what is public information or at least what is displayed to your community when they, once they're logged in and what is completely hidden and probably gives the option to students to say, I don't want to publish this, I don't want to publish that. Uh, and yeah, some of them also integrates with uh, like main student information systems, so they would probably populate the data this way. So if the student information system is already obfuscating that data because of FERPA, then you know it would not be populated into your WordPress instance either. From Lucky my, lost. <laughs> uh, from, just real quick, from my, uh, on FERPA, that's a big point of training. Uh, when we're training anybody on what they're using WordPress for, make sure that they're aware of FERPA because they might not have encountered it before and they're excited about making a web, uh, a web form and oh, I can solicit yeah. student workers, and they put you know, student ID as a field, and we can tell them you can't do that. So, no, anyway. can you explain what FERPA is? Oh, I'm sorry. So FERPA is a U.S. government uh, regulation around uh, privacy of student information. So it stands for um, Federal Educa Education Record Protection. Something, something that starts with A. <laughs> <laughs> Act, probably act. I, I think it depends on the perspective of that. I would be really interested in what you want in an LMS, um, things that are driving us, things that are just um, the love and the truth of Do any of you work with LMSs though? Mm, not really in WordPress, but so what I would love to see as a plugin in WordPress is basically, in fact, I'm running into this scenario right now where basically um, I have uh, a sports department, I have our sports department, they want to sell courses online, they want to sell the Pilates course, the swimming course, the, um, the yoga course. But the thing is, uh, we need to sell it online, we need to charge the tickets, the charge the admission fee. And then we need to manage the course, we need to manage the attendance, manage the instructors, manage the rooms. But we don't need to deliver the course. We just need to give the instructor a class list and then have, it, have him or she, uh, he or she report back after the class is done. I mean, there's, nothing, there's no online component to the class. 
And right now, I find that's a big, big uh, lacking feature within LMSs right now and plugins out there. So we're thinking about doing it within Gravity Forms and uh, having a custom solution with a few custom post types and a, a Gravity Form and then cut some custom reporting. And so basically, it's, it's class management without the content delivery. We're actually using, um, for our cooperative extension, uh, they offer courses to the general public, and some of them are free. A lot of them have, course, like the Master Gardener course has a, a fee associated with it. And the, our university IT department actually set up a WooCommerce uh, solution for them for this. Uh, it's on a separate multi-site for cooperative extension because um, that as like, we have 20,000 user accounts on that uh, system because of the existence of WooCommerce. So. And I, I don't, I really don't work that much with LMSs, so I, I, I kind of don't have much to share about it. However, our executive um, department, uh, executive education department, just did a pretty cool integration with Salesforce. Uh, they do all their, you know, enrollment and catalog management inside of Salesforce, and they did like uh, using the WordPress API, a full like import export of the content. So whenever something happened in Salesforce, it's reflected on the website, et cetera, and vice versa, and that gives them like a lot of flexibility and just one single point of truth and this kind of cool things. And yeah, there's there's some good interactions to create between WordPress and other systems. Thank you very much, and can I get you to thank our speakers today? I hope you learned something. <laughs> and come up and get your koala. <laughs> well, I did ask a question, so I would like to call all of you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs>